Hi, my name is J.D. Miller, and I'm the chairman of the board for Care for Friends, a nonprofit organization in Chicago's Lincoln Park neighborhood. When people first hear about the work we do with homeless and at-risk individuals, they often categorize it as a soup kitchen, or imagine it as a place one might go to for a warm coat or a pair of winter gloves. And yes, we do give out a lot of food and clothes to the city's most vulnerable as part of our work. We also provide hygiene items, doctor's visits, and much more. But I believe that the most important thing we do is to create community, not just among our homeless guests, but also with volunteers, businesses, and homeowners in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Chicago. And this community creates long-lasting, life-changing results for both the homeless and the housed that come in contact with it. When I was in my early 20s, I was fortunate enough to have worked at one of the most successful technology companies to go public during the dot-com boom. I recognized my luck and went looking for opportunities to help others achieve a similarly great life, and I was particularly drawn to the plight of Chicago's homeless. Our mayor had pledged commitment to a 10-year plan to end homelessness, but a few years into it, the number of homeless in Chicago had gone up, not down. I looked across the variety of groups in Chicago who were trying to address the issue, and I discovered something interesting. On one hand, there were a group of programs that gave homeless people stuff. They were the types of groups one might want to volunteer at during Thanksgiving or Christmas time to get a shot of feeling good about yourself. Cook a meal, hand out a coat, play Santa to an underprivileged family, and be on your way. But while these programs addressed an immediate need, they did little to make long-term change. The whole challenge about giving a man a fish so he eats for a day, but neglecting to teach the man to fish so he can eat for a lifetime. And while volunteering in this way feels great in that holiday movie moment kind of way, those who work in the programs multiple times express dissatisfaction that they haven't really done much to really change a life. On the other hand, Chicago also had a few very strong programs that really produced great outcomes for their clients places where job skills are developed, addictions are managed, and homes are secured for the long term. But the results came from participating in rigorous, structured programs. And from the outside looking in, Chicago's homeless were too skeptical or distrustful of the organizations to take the first step inside. So the program struggled with only reaching a few dozen or a few hundred of the city's 100,000 people who experience homelessness in a given year. You see, trust is a really big thing with homeless people. Perhaps they're young people who got kicked out of their family home for being LGBT, or have lost a job that they never thought would go away. Maybe they've struggled with addiction or mental health issues. Did you know that even a person who started out mentally healthy shows signs of severe mental health degradation within just a few weeks of living on the street? Or maybe the person has questionable immigration status, large uncollected debts, or prior brushes with the law that make them hesitant to provide their name, social security number, or ID as part of a check-in process to a program that says they'll make things better. Whatever the issue, these folks were living on the streets of Lincoln Park, a community that definitely had all the resources they needed to live a better life, but they weren't getting connected with them over the long term. So between these two extremes, I found Care for Friends. Back in the summer of 68, Chicago played host to a contentious Democratic National Convention, and there were all sorts of riots and protests in the park where our homeless now live. And so a local church opened its doors to let the protesters in, giving them a place to escape the tear gas, have something to eat, or sleep in a church pew. And they didn't ask for ID, didn't even ask for names. They just asked what was needed and how they could help. And when the convention was over, the community kept asking these questions. It soon grew beyond the work of the church and became a collaboration between local restaurants who could provide consistent meals, local running stores who could provide a new pair of shoes, and so on, and so on, and so on. Nearly 50 years later, the collaboration had gotten to be way too big for the church to manage, and so a nonprofit organization was born to provide management and structure to this undertaking that now included hundreds of volunteers doing a wide variety of things. And I was honored to be asked to be a founding member of that board and serve as its president. In those early days, we spent a lot of time talking about our vision, deciding that it was to merge what was good about both types of organizational extremes we'd seen, to be the place that both addressed people's immediate needs for food or warmth, as well as to make long-term improvements in their lives. And so we declared that our mission was to connect the most vulnerable with the resources they need to achieve a better quality of life 
and that we do it through participation in a community of dignity and respect that had no barriers to entry. When we started to look at what resources we had to make that happen, we realized that this notion of conversation in community was something special and something that we'd used over and over in the past to address a variety of problems. A few years ago, some of our immediate neighbors who'd lived through gentrification and now lived in multi-million dollar homes down the block were concerned about and afraid of some of the people that they saw walking down their sidewalk to head towards our hot lunch. And we recognized that those neighbors are also part of our community that needed to be served. So we invited them over for a series of meals and conversations to understand the issues and to come up with processes and strategies that would address them. As a result, we now have staff members and volunteers who are a visible presence in the neighborhood for the hours before and after each of our programs. They recognize and have relationships with our neighbors as well as our homeless guests, and they're a resource that either can call on if something doesn't feel quite right. The fears went away. Many of those neighbors now actually volunteer in the program, and they say that it's an important experience that they want their own children to have as part of becoming a well-rounded grown-up. And suddenly, the program wasn't about us versus them, the downtrodden poor versus the wealthy elite. It was about both sides mingling together in the same neighborhood, the same place, and the same space. Over the years, we also got to know a lot of people who had studied the issue of homelessness. They taught us that three major contributors to the issue are poor access to education and job training, lack of affordable housing, and difficulties achieving sober mental and physical health. And as we continued the conversation with our community, we also realized that we knew some programs that were leaders in their ability to address each of those three things. When we spoke with our homeless members, we also learned about that trust thing and the barriers that they were finding to entry into these programs. And so we began to think more intentionally about the community meal that began in that church decades ago. We made sure the meal wasn't just a cafeteria style one that shuffled as many people down the line as possible but more like a meal you'd share with your closest friends in your own home. We opened the doors for a few hours before and after the lunch was gonna be served so that people could gather and have conversation. Often it's the only conversation our homeless guests would have with another human being that day or that week. We serve our meals restaurant style, seating over 100 guests at a time in tables of six or eight where they could develop relationships with one another and with our volunteers. And mixed into those tables are representatives from partner organizations who were highly skilled at delivering housing or job skills or addiction treatment. But just as our guests aren't asked to register or sign in on a sheet to identify themselves if they don't want to, our guests from the partner programs don't overtly identify as being a doctor or a caseworker right off the bat either. Over time, those shared conversations, the shared experience of breaking bread together, develops trusted relationships where these things become natural to disclose. But by that point, a relationship is formed that doesn't make Dr. Mark or Dr. Anthony stern rule makers who demand you adhere to a set of laws. They're just Mark and Anthony, who you know and trust, and who might have a way to ease you into a program that's going to really help make things better. And the results of these intentional relationships have been astonishing. When we looked at the big three causes of homelessness, one of the first intentional partnerships we established was with an agency that has a very strong interim housing program, but who complained that they didn't have great routes to bring people in the doors. Within the first six months of their caseworkers participating in our meals, they reported that 46% of all of their clients originated at a Care for Friends event. Once in the program, 76% of their guests obtained long-term housing, and 80% of those folks remained housed a year later when we check in on them for follow-up. It was a great way for us to address that particular root cause of homelessness. We then turned to the second big item on our list, education and job skills training. And again, we found a really well-regarded program in the city who similarly struggled with making connections to potential clients. Within the first 30 days of them joining our meals, they'd enrolled six of our guests in job skills programs. Upon graduation, participants wind up in jobs where they work an average of 38 hours a week at an average wage of $12.34 an hour. And when they're contacted for a one-year follow-up, 78% of those people remain employed at the same job, another example of community connections creating lasting life change. We see similar results in our programs to create sober mental and physical health. 
So many of our guests are vets or citizens who are entitled to a wide variety of medical insurance benefits that they were afraid to access or didn't know how to register for until they met a health navigator at a lunch. Within the first 90 days of our intentional partnership, we'd gotten over 80 guests registered into Medicare or an insured healthcare program, and within the first year, we saw over 600 doctor-patient interactions that would have either never taken place or been conducted in a public emergency room at much greater cost to the community. Today, over 50% of our guests report that they found a permanent medical home. And these changes aren't just an abstract idea. I see them regularly in the lives of people like a man I'll call John, who's been sober for 10 years, has a stable home, and a full-time job with health benefits. Or in the action of a woman I'll call Linda, who earned her cosmetology license, is working at a salon, and volunteers her time to provide haircuts for other guests to help them on their way towards a better life. Chicago's most recent citywide count found that the number of homeless has declined 13% since the previous year's count, achieving the lowest level of homelessness in a decade. And while I certainly wouldn't say that Care for Friends is solely or directly responsible for this great change, I know that the relationships we have with organizations that do is helping them to see many more guests than they had previously, and they have much stronger relationships than they would if our community meal didn't exist. I also know that we continue to look for ways to increase the number of connections we make in not just the homeless community, but the larger Chicago community that we're all members of. Lately, that's taken us to tackling the awkward interactions that many folks have with homeless people they encounter on the street who ask for spare change. So many people ignore the request and in the process dehumanize the person asking. But at the same time, they know they don't want to give a dollar to everyone who asks for it. And so we've developed a set of care cards. They're business cards that list the days, times, and locations of all of our community gatherings for meals, medical care, and so on. And they're designed to be easy to carry in a pocket or a bag and hand out whenever you encounter someone who might benefit from the services. And like our meals, we make care cards available to anyone who asks, as often as they ask, simply by going to the Care for Friends website and letting us know where you'd like us to mail a stack. In doing so, we're not just helping the homeless person, but we're helping the card carrier to feel less shame or guilt and actually become a contributing member of the community that solves the problem. If you're a Chicagoan, I hope you'll join me in contributing to the community by going to our website and requesting some free cards now to share with people on the street you see who might need them. That's also the place where you can let us know if there's another resource we should be connecting our friends to. And if you're not a Chicagoan, I hope you may be inspired to find a small way to help your communities most vulnerable, wherever you live. It's a small thing. In fact, all of these are small things. Handing someone a card, having a conversation, sharing a meal, creating a connection. But in each of these small acts, we're creating a community that connects our most vulnerable with what they need to have a better life. And that is a pretty big deal indeed.